Friends, thank you for joining me again as we take some time this Holy Week to contemplate the seven last words of Christ. Someone's last words have always been viewed as significant, haven't they? What was so important that a person would spend precious energy to communicate it to others? Well, traditionally, Christians have used these last statements by Jesus as a way of of deepening our understanding of what was and is important to the heart of God. In this session, we get to contemplate the second of the last statements by Jesus. These are words spoken to one of two thieves that are hanging with him at Golgotha. Jesus says to him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Here's the rest of the story. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Traditionally, we say the statement from Jesus is all about salvation. Today you will be with me in paradise. And when we tell this story, we usually focus on the idea that because God so loved the world, the only begotten Son came, and that through his life and ministry, we are saved. And that is good, and that is beautiful, and that is true. But I have to admit, when I read this story, I I see something different. What I see is mercy. Now, sure, mercy is a part of the whole salvation idea. I'm not denying that. But but think about the scene with me for a moment. Here we have two men hanging on crosses with Jesus. And just as we are contemplating Jesus' last words, we should also pay attention to the thieves and their last words as well. What is so significant to them that they would spend their final breaths expressing it? Well, clearly one of them is angry, isn't he? He's probably feeling a great deal of fear. And for a lot of us, and I know this is true for me, when I am afraid, I can be just horrible. And this man who is berating Jesus and mocking him is clearly projecting all his emotional fears and physical pains onto Jesus as a way of avoiding having to face them head on. Now, in the scripture, Jesus doesn't say anything to this thief, but I think it's safe to assume that he was included in the request to God, Father, forgive him, he doesn't know what he's doing. But it's the second thief's words that give rise to Jesus' own that we're considering here. Luke tells us, but the other rebuked him. He essentially told his friend to shut up. The second thief had somehow miraculously seen something true about who Jesus was, and it changed him. He became aware of his own conduct, of all the things that he'd done and left undone, of all the things that he'd said and left unsaid. In this moment on the cross, he was painfully aware that he had nothing, and all he could do was ask Jesus for mercy. And it surprises none of us that Jesus offered it. Biblical scholars don't precisely know what Jesus meant by paradise. It it may have been heaven, we're not exactly sure. But what we do know is that Jesus told the thief he would be in pain no more. He would be saved. Mercy has become a valuable truth for me in recent years. After years and years of trying to establish a consistent prayer life, and yes, even pastors struggle with a consistent prayer life, you are not alone. But after years of trying to find a practice I can stick with, one thing I have found that is helpful is praying an ancient prayer called the Jesus Prayer. This is a form of prayer that is primarily practiced by Eastern Orthodox Christians, but but people in many denominations have found it to be life-giving as I have. The practice is simple. You pray a very simple prayer over and over for a while, and it goes like this. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Some people use a timer when they pray. I use a string of beads to count my repetitions. But as you repeat these words, you are invited to prayerfully consider their meanings. And I have found their meanings to change for me depending on what is happening in my life. There are times when I pray for mercy 
and the mercy I need is because of an arrogance and pride within me. I am literally begging God's forgiveness. I am acknowledging to my Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that I have sinned and, I'm, and I am in desperate need of pardon. It doesn't matter to me that I know I'm always already forgiven, that God has forgiven me even though I didn't know what I was doing. I need to hear that God has forgiven me, has mercy on me, and loves me. But then there are times like the ones we're living through right now, where my prayers for mercy are because I can't help but see that I'm a fragile and weak and vulnerable man. There's a virus marching across our nation and our planet, and I'm begging God for mercy. I'm begging God to save us. And truly, the only hope I have is clinging to the words of Jesus that we will be with him in paradise. Really, it's all any of us have. And so friends, whether you're hiding from fear and are ashamed, today you will receive mercy and be with Jesus in paradise. Or whether you are suddenly aware of all the ways you have taken advantage of your status and your position in life, and you might be embarrassed by that, today you will receive mercy and be in paradise. Or if like me, you're scared and you're worried and you're anxious or you're overwhelmed and like you just can't put one foot in front of the other and you have no idea how you're going to make tomorrow even happen, truly I tell you, you will receive mercy and you will be in paradise. Amen.